Hello Blood Bowl fans and welcome to Blood Bowl Basics Race Rundowns starting with the most touted faction to beginners, the humans. Now, they are a pretty good starting race for learning basic tactics, for learning basic strategy, and for learning basically how the game works. However, you're not going to win with humans early on. Humans actually take a lot of practice to be able to play well. And it's something that isn't mentioned to beginners. They're just told, play humans, humans will teach you the game. But um, they won't teach you to win. And most people find that humans are not the race for them. There are a couple of human coaches that I know that are very, very good. But generally speaking, they're not the race that are going to be the first race that you fall in love with and manage to really get into this game and get really good at this game, be able to win relatively commonly and regularly. <clears throat> What Cyanide says about the humans then, let's have a look at that first. They can adapt their style to their opponent's weaknesses. That's not entirely true. They play differently depending on an opponent's weaknesses. I wouldn't say they can necessarily adapt their style, though. Their movement is above average. Yes, it is. Advantaging running play, which it does. It also gives them a slight advantage over Bash, though they're going to lose in Bash situations. And they're easy to play but hard to master. It's true. It's easy to get the grips of the game playing this team, but it's very difficult, like I said, to be able to properly play as them. And their weaknesses then. Their strengths are based on their skill rather than their stats. That's very true. Their block helps, not necessarily their strength. And they cannot perform extremely well in one style of play. That's true when we're talking about a combination of bash, dash, or even hybrid. Yes, they're not really any of those three teams, but they can perform extremely well in a specific style of play. It's just it's specific to humans. Anyway, we'll have a look at that in a minute. So what it says here then, although humans teams do not have the individual strengths of outstanding abilities available to other races, they do not suffer from any outstanding weaknesses either. This makes human teams extremely flexible, equally at home running the ball, passing it or ignoring it and pounding the opposition into the turf instead. That's a very nice little bit of fluff. I wouldn't entirely agree. They don't have any outstanding strength, that's true. They don't have any outstanding weakness either, that's true. But it doesn't mean that they can do everything as a result. That's not what it means. What it means is you've got to be able to work specifically to the opponent you're playing, which makes them actually one of the hardest teams to get really good at playing as. So humans are good for learning the basics, but if you already have a grasp of the basics, then these are actually a challenging team to play. Anyway, let's have a look at the actual teams themselves. Let's just make a team very quickly. So, what should we call them? Uh, let's call them Oh the Humanity. I'd be surprised if that isn't taken, though. And that will do. We'll keep them with the Reichland Ravers. Of course it's taken. Um, so, yeah, let's just put some dots. That will probably work. There we go. And... The old world, let's play in Reichland, because that's where humans are supposed to be from. And I'm not gonna make I'm not gonna use the generated team because we'll have a look at specific team builds instead. But first of all, let's have a look at pieces individually, starting with the big guy. Now, what I'm about to say is going to be met with some very aggressive people saying that I'm wrong. And I want to reiterate, there is nothing wrong in Blood Bowl, there's just different opinions. Now, the big guy can be essential. However, he is not essential to a human team. If you are an absolute beginner, I wouldn't even say he is essential to you. And the reason I say that, I will back it up. He is essential in that he adds that extra strength where the rest of the team doesn't have it, and he can stand against the orcs, he can stand against the dwarfs, etc, etc. However, he is also a piece that beginners use completely wrongly, and as a result, he becomes useless in the team. So, the big guy is great, in a way. However, he is so easy, it's so easy to create problems using the big guy incorrectly. So things to know about the big guy before anything else. He has some fairly standard stats for a big guy. He has relatively fine movement as big guys go. He has pretty good strength. He's got basic strength for a big guy. His agility is more than one, so that's a good start. And he has a pretty high armor value 
with a fixed skull as well, which means he's not likely to disappear from the match. That's all great. He does have Mighty Blow, which basically means that when you punch somebody, there's a 1 plus chance that you'll knock that person out of the pitch using Mighty Blow, which is also great, if you need it. He has for a teammate, which he doesn't need, and he is a loner, and he has Bonehead, and these two skills are very important if you are new to the game. Bonehead. Every time you try to do something with the ogre, you have to roll a dice. If you roll a 1, the ogre just goes, duh, and stands there. And when he's standing there, he is basically not on the pitch. He has no tackle zones. He can't do anything. People can run away from him. People can run around him. He's just basically a stone in the middle of the pitch that can do absolutely nothing until next turn. And when that happens, if that happens at a crucial time, it can really screw you over. And that is matched with Loner. If you want to, you can re-roll the Bonehead. It's a bad idea though, because he has Loner. And what Loner means basically is that you have to roll a dice to see if you can re-roll your dice. And if you get a 4+, plus, which is 50%, it means that you can re-roll your Bonehead, or you can re-roll your block, whatever. If you get 1 to 3 though, then the original dice result sticks, and you also waste a reroll. <coughs> Things to mention as well, when a ogre levels up, if you get a normal roll, if you don't get a double, then you only have access to strength skills. Things like Mighty Blow, Fix Skull, Stand Firm, Grab, etc, etc. We'll get into all that a bit later. Everything else requires a double, even basic things like Block. And Block is probably the best double for an ogre. I personally like pro, a lot of people don't like pro, but block is the best option for an ogre, being honest. Now, the reason I say that an ogre is not necessary to the team is because in certain situations he's actually in the way. Uh, in certain situations you absolutely need him, uh, I agree, but there are ways to deal with that. And in other situations he is just in the way and he kind of is an unreliable piece where you need your pieces to be reliable. If you're playing a game, a team against orcs, a game against dwarfs, etc., then big guy is great. If I've got one in the team, he's coming off the bench. If I'm playing a game against an agility-based team, I'm probably not going to play him though, because I need the maneuverability, and he is not maneuverable. So if I have him in the team and I have a bench, then good, he goes on the bench, no problem. However, the mighty blow, etc. doesn't help, because I don't want to activate him every single turn. And this is where rookie mistakes come in. The thing I always see happen when somebody has an ogre, is they try to punch every single turn. Now, that's great, but statistically, one in six turns, you're going to fail, and you're going to be standing there doing nothing. If you are going to punch with the ogre, make sure it's the last thing you do in your turn, just in case. Make sure that you've set up everything else so it's nice and safe. So if it goes wrong, which it will eventually, you can recover from it going wrong. If he gets double skull and goes to the ground, then at least you have other pieces in position. If he boneheads, then at least you haven't left a big gap where everything can run through him. So make sure that you, if you're going to use the ogre, that you set up your team so they're ready for the ogre to fail. That's on offense and defense. Most of the time though, to be honest, the ogre is better just standing where he is, locking up a few pieces and that's it. But eventually those pieces are gonna get away from you. And when those pieces get away from you is where the ogre really falls down, I think. Because as soon as everything's moved away, you have to move the ogre. And if it works, it's great. If it doesn't, then you basically have lost a piece in your team. So I have mixed feelings about the ogre. In general, for that reason. For beginners, because there are so many mistakes you can make with an ogre. Using him first, using him unnecessarily, things like this. So if you want to have a play with the ogre, have a play. I mean, he's definitely fun. He can do some damage. And he can be really useful if you can use him but make sure you learn how to use him first. That's it for the ogre. Having a look at a Blitzer then. Blitzers are really the star of the human team. They're one of the most important pieces. They are pretty fast with movement seven. That's quite fast for an average piece. They have average strength at three, average agility at three, and average armor value at eight. So they're relatively average, but slightly above average with movement. Now they have access to both general and strength when they're leveling, so they get all of the really useful skills and they also get some damage dealing skills and they get they need a double for agility or pass skills, which you don't really need on a blitzer. Generally speaking, 
early on at least, blitzers are the pieces that are going to be taking the blocks. Because they're the safest pieces as they have the block skill. What block does is that when you take a block, if you get a two down, which is this symbol you can see, I can't move the mouse because you'll lose it, but the symbol you can see where it says after a block on a skull, pow, this is a two down. If you get two two downs, your guy is still standing, with some exceptions, but forget the exceptions for now. The way that many people make these blitzers, they always take all four of them. They use two of them as damage dealing pieces and two of them as support pieces, but we'll talk about that when we're looking at team build a little bit later on. Generally speaking though, you want all four of these guys in your team from the very beginning, and you want to use them as often as possible. Don't put them on the line of scrimmage though, unless you're on a fence potentially, but on defense definitely don't because you don't want people getting free blocks against them. You want to keep them at least one square back so people have to blitz them if they want to. And when you're on offense, then make sure they're in positions where they're either going to be punching as often as possible or they're going to be in a position where they're going to punch in the next turn. So that's basically it for blitzes. They are, they are your damage dealing pieces, even more so than the ogre. We'll have a look at the catcher and the thrower in a second, but first let's have a look at the lineman. The lineman is your very basic stand, on, stand piece where his job is basically to get punched in the face and to stand in the way of opposition positions. He's not likely to do a lot of damage. He's not likely to do a lot of things with the ball. He's not likely to really do anything other than be a nuisance. That's what linemen are for in most teams. He has movement allowance six, which is average. He has average all around the board, basically. Six movement, three strength, three agility, and eight armor. This is probably the median statistics for any piece. He has general access and general access only, so he has access to all of the basic skills that can make your team slightly safer. Things like block, things like wrestle, and things like fend, for example. All things that can make a team safer in general. To be honest though, you're not worried about leveling them up too much, because they're not going to be... They can develop into pieces that are very useful, but generally speaking, they're not overly useful pieces in the team. They're basically there to get punched and to hold the line. That's their main job. You will take injuries on linemen. It's inevitable. Uh, main thing is, don't be too worried if they suffer an injury or even if they die, because they're pretty easily replaceable, even if they have leveled a bit. So that's all I'm going to say about the linemen. Then we have the catcher and the thrower combination. Now. A lot of teams have catchers and throwers, and in the human team it's kind of essential to the way they play, because you need pieces that can actually handle the ball and pieces that can throw the ball if absolutely necessary. Throwing and passing in general, even though it's something that I do a lot in my games and it's something that I highly, highly value, a lot of coaches don't. And um, especially at the start, it's, you're better off doing it as little as possible, because it is risky, risky play. However, the catcher. He does have the best movement in the team, with movement 8. He does have the weakest strength, which is really a shame. I think he should have strength 3, but he has strength 2, which means that he is quite easy to punch and get 2 dies against. He has agility 3, which is average, unfortunately, and he has average armor value again. He does have 2 skills, which help him a bit. He has dodge, which means that the opponent needs to get a pow to knock him down, or a block piece needs to get a 2 down to get him down to the ground. And he has catch which means that he rerolls a failed catch chance if somebody gives him a handoff, if somebody passes to him, or if he's making an inception, interception, sorry, then he rerolls all of these things. <clears throat> he has access to general and agility, so the first thing you're going to give him is probably block, just to make him safe, and then after that you can give him quite a lot of skills and you can develop him differently. You can have up to four on the team. A lot of people play with two, I personally play with one, but the two is more common, and that's basically it for the catcher. He is the absolute star in your team. He's the person who's going to be scoring the most. That's his main job. And then you have the thrower. You can have up to two of these in the team. They have six movement, three strength, three agility, eight armor value, so they have the exact same stat line as the lineman, but they have some extra skills. And they are both. Uh, one is general skill, and one is a pass skill. They have pass, which means they re-roll any throw, so if you throw and it is inaccurate or it fumbles, it will automatically reroll. And they have sure hands, which means they will reroll a pickup if it fails. 
They have access to general and access to passing, which means you can make them really a passing piece with some passing skills, or you can make them a nice, safe ball carrier and you can use them as a scorer as well. And that's basically it for the thrower, and the thrower and catcher should be used in combination, mostly. But the closer they are to each other, the easier it is to use them and the more reliable they are to use. So the linemen, the blitzers, and the ogre if you have one, hold the line and make sure that nothing is getting close to the thrower, nothing is getting close to the catcher. That's basic human strategy. Now let's take a quick break here and then we're going to have a look at team build. Alright, I've gone ahead and made a starting team, and I think this is the most common setup for a human team, though there are some other options, we will have a look at each of them, I'll actually talk about them briefly. So you start off with 1 million gold in the bank, and you're looking to get a TV1000 team, what we call a TV1000 team. It's a starting roster where you've maximized the value of the 1 million that you get. And the best way to start, the safest way to start is with free team rerolls. If you cannot afford free team rerolls, then you set up your human team wrong, go back and do it again. The humans need free team rerolls specifically. If nothing else, I would say that is <clears throat> absolutely true. The reason is, when they're playing against bash-heavy teams like orcs, like dwarves, they need to dodge sometimes, and they're not really reliable at dodging, and the rerolls give them that little bit of extra help in that regard. Also it helps with the clutch plays where you have to make a very difficult pass, where you have to move a piece into a position that is really difficult, or for really, really, really tight situations for re-rolling an ogre. You need extra team rerolls team re for this. I personally would also take a cheerleader and a coach assistant, though a lot of people are against this. The only reason I take this is because most coaches don't, and when you get these roles, when you kick off the cheerleader, the fan factor role and the uh, perfect coaching role, you get a free re roll and that really helps with a human team. <clears throat> Having a look at the basic build then, we've got the free team re -rolls. we've got our big guy, the ogre, we've got four blitzers, we've got thrower, catcher, and four linemen. 11-man roster, no bench. This is probably the most advised setup. The only thing you can do instead is you can replace the catcher for a lineman, which a lot of people recommend, I don't really understand why. So, if you're going to start with the catcher, you may as well start with the catcher. Because you only get an extra 1,000 if you... an extra 2,000, sorry, if you drop the catcher, which doesn't give you anything extra here. So, I don't see the point in dropping the catcher. The four blitzers are essential, as is arguably the ogre, though I wouldn't say so, and I think these two pieces are essential too. Your basic thing is when you're on defense, you put three of these four guys on the line, you put your blitzers on the wings, your last lineman is, in, is there in support, uh, two, li two linemen and ogre probably actually on the line, sorry. You've got two linemen in support, your blitzers on the wings, and thrower and catcher somewhere in the back on defense. On offense, very similar, you put ogre on the line with two linemen, you put the other two linemen not somewhere near the wing where they can do some damage, and your blitzers are looking to pick off those weak pieces that have been poorly positioned on your opposition defense, or they're looking to fin the lineman numbers on the opposite side. The thrower stays back far enough to pick up the ball, roughly in the center of your half, and the catcher stays relatively close to him, so you can move them where you want to in the next couple of turns. That's your basic look at human team in general. Now, there are a few things you can do differently here if you really want to. There are a couple more I would say legitimate builds, people would say otherwise maybe, but there is at least one more legitimate build that is quite common, and that is if you drop the ogre, everyone who wants to scream, they can, I mean a lot of people would recommend the ogre, that's absolutely fine. You can drop the ogre, you can take a second catcher, and then you can either take an extra lineman, or you can take an apothecary straight away. And the main difference between this setup and the last setup is that this team is faster, and this team is more maneuverable. You're going to struggle against orcs, you're going to struggle against dwarfs, I'm not going to lie, the ogre is missing for that regard, and it's going to be very difficult. In this setup, I would actually probably go apothecary, because it's safer, and buy the lineman as the first purchase, but you can buy the lineman instead and buy the apothecary as the first purchase, depending on what kind of thing you're facing. If you're in a league where you know exactly what you're facing, against an agility-based team, elves, skaven, 
Anything with low armor, basically, I would take the extra lineman, if that was my first game. If my first game was against orcs, against dwarfs, etc, etc, then I'm taking the apothecary, because it's just safer. Though, also, I'm probably taking the ogre, if I have a very bash-heavy league to deal with, division to deal with. So the main difference between this and the ogre setup is that you are faster with this kind of team. And you have two catches now, so it does mean that you have two pieces that are relatively exposed to being damaged, so it's something you need to be aware of at all times. You always have free linemen on the line in offense and defense with this kind of team. Your blitzers are still on the flanks, and you have a catcher on either flank center, and the thrower stays back to receive the ball. Basically, the difference is here, you can attack both flanks at once, and your team has to guess as to where the ball is going. It does require a lot more team management skill than the Ogre though. The Ogre setup is easier for a beginner, debatably, so long as you learn how to use the Ogre quickly. So we'll stick with the beginner setup for now. Bringing back the Ogre and I'll leave him here. Oh yeah, I need to cancel the Apothecary. Sorry. So we're gonna have a look mostly at this setup, I guess. I still can't afford him, because I've still got the buff carry. Never mind, you get the idea. There's supposed to be an ogre here. I don't know why I'm actually doing it. It doesn't really matter. Confirm. Right, so. From here, I'm going to have a look at a developed team that I actually have that's already going. They're not overly developed, but I'll tell you about the way they have developed and the way they're going to develop further. So let's just make a quick break here and move on to a team that has developed a little bit. This is actually going to be my Wood Wars team as well. Okay, so I will have a look at my Wood Wars team in a minute, but I want to have a look at a more developed team. And I have taken a AI build, so this is not ideal by any stretch, but it gives you a basic idea of the way that you can develop your team. Uh, the Ogre, I would highly recommend not doing what they've done, as I would say the same with, actually, the Blitzers. Dauntless is a bit too early. Uh, catchers, sorry. No, the Catchers are fine. Never mind. The Catchers are fine. And the linemen are fine as well. So let's have a quick look at the way this team has been built. So this team is the same setup, but we've got some catches as we've gone along in the game. Some linemen have died. That's basically what's happened in this setup. When your linemen die, it's fairly legitimate to take catches. I personally would never, ever take all four catches. No way. But a lot of coaches do. I think two is more than enough, because that minus strength is a real problem for you in a lot of situations. And if you've got all four catches, basically, I feel like you need the four linemen just in reserve, just in case. The problem with this team is that you've only got the three men for the line. So you've got the ogre and the two linemen, and they're always going to be on the line. If one is injured, all of a sudden you need to put an important piece on the line. So not good news. However, it has shown you basically how these pieces are developing, and that's what I'm more interested in at the moment. So the lineman that has actually leveled up has been given block, which is a very common thing to give a lineman. Anything beyond block really is just a bonus. If your lineman gets a block, then great, and then beyond that you can just build them with things like tackle just as extra support pieces to take out opposition that are a problem. Uh, there's also an argument for wrestle, though your linemen don't move so often, so block is usually better on a human lineman. As for your blitzers, there are three basic builds, and they've all been kind of shown here, but they've been shown in a weird way. There are three basic things that you want on almost all of your blitzers. That's Mighty Blow, Guard, and Tackle. And you can do it in different orders. So you're probably going to build a piece that starts with Mighty Blow, like they have here. Though I would follow up with Tackle, probably. And follow up with things that basically cause damage. So you've got a piece that is there to kill. You can argue piling on. I'm personally not such a big fan of piling on, but a lot of people would argue for it. You then have a blitzer that is basically an anti-elf, which is this one here. He's been started with tackle, he's getting guard, and his next stop is probably Mighty Blow. After that you can give him pretty much whatever you want. Uh, Frenzy is an option, though it's a strange one. You can give him other things that can really help him, though. Things like stand firm, things like grab, things that basically make sure that the elf is not getting away from him. That's what this piece is for. I would also build the ogre in a similar way, as a elf is not getting away from you piece. And then you've got two blitzers that start off as support, they both start with guard, and later on they get given extra skills. Again, things like stand firm and grab are legitimate, mighty blow is useful, tackle needs to come in later as well. Basically these are the three things you need. Tackle, 
guard and mighty blow on all three pieces and then after that you can play around with them and get a couple of extra jobs out of them. But you need a piece to kill, you need an anti-elf and you need extra support. And the extra support pieces are the pieces that take the stand firm, the grab, etc etc. And as for the ogre, this build is weird. Guard is essential. I think it's always going to be your first level up unless you get a double on an ogre. Stats, I don't know, I'd actually miss most of them. I would take strength, but I'd only take one. I wouldn't bother with agility, because your ogre's not going to do anything with the ball. Uh, definitely not bother with armor value, it's completely useless, and he doesn't need to move too often, so there's not even point in taking movement. Strength is arguably something you can take. If you get a double, then start off with block. After that, you can take tackle if you want to make him a murder piece, or a, at the very least a you're not getting away from me piece. But mostly you want to make him a what we call a roadblock, which means that nothing is getting through him, nothing is getting around him. So he wants stand firm, he wants grab, he wants these things that are going to keep things stood next to him and not going anywhere. So a second double tackle is also a good idea, because it counteracts dodge when people are trying to dodge out of his tackle zones. So the ideal ogre for me would have guard, block, tackle, stand firm, grab, and he's probably not leveling beyond that, but that would be the things that he has. Piling on never, ever, 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 ever. I don't know why they've given him this. If you want to have a joke, piling on is great. If you're playing the game seriously, then do not give an ogre piling on. It's a pointless skill, and he's going to spend a lot of the game on the ground. And I did say I would have a look at my own human team, so let's do that very quickly. I probably should have cut, but never mind. I'm going to find it relatively fast. So I have a human team in the Wood Wars, which is also part of this series. At the moment they haven't developed very far, and they've only played, I think, three games, and they've played pretty badly so far. They've had one draw and two losses, they've had a really bad start. But they have been built in the standard form, so I will be watching this team develop, and later on, maybe when they've developed well, I'll put an extra bit with, you know, a fully developed team. I've only had the one level up, and I've already made the Mighty Blow piece, because Savage is the one who leveled up. Veteran and Anvil will be my support pieces, they will both start with Guard, they will be followed by Tackle, and they will probably get Mighty Blow third. And Hammer will have, be the Elf Chaser, so he'll have the Mighty Blow, the Tackle, the Guard, probably in that order. And Savage will be a Kill Piece, I'll probably even give him Piling On, etc. later on. And we'll have all the Stand Firms and the Guards here as well. Ogre, we'll see how he levels, but um, I don't care so much about an Ogre to be honest, but guard I want on him after that, we'll see how he develops. The thrower, who I didn't mention actually when I was looking at the last team, that was silly, well we'll go back to that in a minute. The thrower, whenever I'm playing him, because I throw a lot, I actually make a throwing piece, so he takes a lot of passing skills, he takes accurate to give him that one plus to pass, he takes strong arm if he gets a double, because that gives him a chance to throw right up the field. He takes block, of course, and he sometimes takes leader to give us that fourth team reroll, depending on how I feel, though leader does not come first, in my own estimation, in a human team. And the catches. There are some essential level ups for catches, and there are three basic ways to build a catcher. You can build a catcher that is a ball carrier scoring machine. So the first thing you're going to give him is block, pro fo probably followed by sidestep. He's going to get fend and he's going to get anything basically that keeps the opposition away from him. You can also build a Saka catcher, which gets wrestle, strip ball, and basically support things for getting rid of opposition pieces. Probably tackle as well to get things down, though they're not really good at blitzing, it's just that they are good for taking down a piece and then immediately stealing the ball from them. That's the one benefit of having a sacking catcher in a human team. And then after that you can just make a kind of annoying piece that has sidestep, that has diving catch, all this kind of thing that keeps, basically keeps the ball in your possession at all times and makes them really, really difficult to put down. But these pieces should also have block. And um, that's basically it for this team. You can make the argument for Dauntless as well. It should come like it did in the other team where it comes as like the fourth skill, third, fourth skill on a catcher because they only have strength two and Dauntless gives them a chance to have strength three, basically. So there is that. And that's basically it for a human build. Alright, so if we have a look at some basic in-game strategy then, and this is going to be very, very, very opinionated. I mean, people have very different ideas of how to play this game, and there are some key things that you need to consider and some things that 
are down to personal opinion. Now, in this matchup, I've paused it because it's actually live, and it's, it's just a friendly game against myself. I'm just doing it for training purposes, but um, it is live, so I have paused it. I'm playing as an Orc team in this matchup, and I'm going to just have a quick look at what the Orcs have done, because we are on their offense, my defense, and they've already set up. So they've set up with quite an aggressive stance. They've got the Black Orcs ready to do damage to me. They've got three guys who, for some reason, have set up on their own. And then they've got the Blitzers on the flanks, which is relatively common. And the Thrower is back there ready to receive the ball. Now, they've set up just in case of a Blitz, just in case of anything that can cause their Black Orcs to get punched first. But they are going to come straight forward and do some damage immediately. And I've set up one step back, just because against Orcs I want to be playing a fast game. Now, my ideal situation is that these guys all stick around the Ogre, these guys kind of get lost out on the side, these guys kind of get lost out on the side, and the ball is left on his own. Though a good Orc coach will bring pieces back to support the ball, and I will be forced to really fight my way through this gap, which is going to be a bad game. But for general setup stance, I've got the three on the line, the Ogre and the two linemen. I've got the Blitzers on the flanks. The linemen in support, they would go here against a fast team, they stay back against a slow team, or vice versa, depending on your strategy, but my strategy is basically to outspeed the opponent, so I'm staying back, forcing the orcs forward, and the thrower and catcher are back out of the way. And in terms of kick, if I had a kick piece, which is important on the linemen that I forgot to mention, then... Oh, I'm actually receiving. Okay, that went wrong, never mind. The Orcs won the toss, obviously I got it wrong. But still, if we were kicking, let's say that we are kicking, I would be kicking exactly here in this situation. Because the reason I kick exactly here is because no matter where it goes, it's probably staying on the pitch, and it's just a safe kick. If I had kick, though, in this situation I'd be putting it over here or over here, so the thrower had to go and chase it. That's it for the setup for defense. Okay, this time I'm actually on offense, I'm playing against an agility team. Uh, I was going to do both, but it's going to take too long actually. So, the basic concept is the same, but it's different depending on agility or strength. If I was setting up against the orcs, I would have a much more... I would, have a, I would actually have a slightly thinner line. I would have the linemen back here ready to defend. The blitzers would still be on the flank, and the catcher would be further back, the thrower would be bang smack in the middle. Against Skaven, though, I'm against a very fast team, and if a Blitz comes, or if anything really bad becomes, Skaven can break through. So the, or, or Elves in the same way. So, in this situation, I need to make sure that I don't leave any gaps where an errant defender can actually run through if something goes horribly wrong. But I'm also in a position where I can get everything up forward right in the Skaven's face, because that's what I want to do. Most likely situation, the linemen are both going one step forward, the Blitzers are going to surround this thrower and punch him, probably. And these two blitzes are going to surround this lineman here, forcing all the Skaven in base contact. And we're going to take a hit with the two linemen, hopefully, though it's not necessary. And then the catcher is going to stand back here for a turn and hopefully take one of the flanks, whichever one proves weakest. And the thrower is, of course, going to focus on the ball. The thrower is nice and deep here, because against agility teams, you're normally facing a kick piece. And basically, if the ball goes anywhere back here, the thrower can get it. If it goes too far forward, the catcher can get it and the thrower can get into a position where they can pass to the catcher quite easily. So that's it for offensive setup. Okay, so going a bit deeper into this game and just talking about some basic positioning things, and I will say I've had some bad luck in this game so far, actually. I've already had to use two rerolls to get to this point, which is awful. But um, just having a quick look at where we are at the moment in this game. My ogre hasn't actually moved at all in the three turns that we've played. He's been here the whole time. I haven't even activated him once. I have actually managed two knockouts, though I had a big problem where the Skaven broke through and they, know, or they almost got the ball because of a fail block. And now he's left a nice big gap in this flank, so I've taken advantage of it by putting the team there. In terms of basic screening, there are a few things you can do with a human team. You can make a cage, which is probably going to be something I'm looking at later, which is one piece, two piece, three piece, four piece around the ball. I'm not a big fan of the cage myself, but a lot of coaches do like it. And following on from that, you can make a basic screen, which is what I'm doing here. Uh, this screen is not secure by any means at the moment, but it will be later on in the game. 
I brought the bull forward to show that I am going to threaten this side. If the Skaven come this way, the bull goes back this way. If the Skaven stay that side, the bull carries on up. But at the moment, they're going to stay at the back. I can actually keep it here for at least three more turns before I have to think about scoring realistically. The important thing, though, is that whenever you do make a screen, any kind of screen, talking in general now, you need to have pieces that are no more than two gaps apart, because these two provide tackle zones, and something has to dodge through to get to the ball. That's the main thing to keep in mind when you're screening. That's all I really wanted to say, and that's all I'm going to say for basic strategy at the moment, and for humans in general, I think. So let's get off this game. So just to finish off then, I'm not going to do in-game things for every video, I think. I'm just playing with it at the moment to see what I like doing. This isn't going to be the best one either, by the way, but a lot of people don't play humans, so I thought I'd just use this as a chance to talk about basic tactics and human build in general. Later on, hopefully the videos will be a little bit more interesting. So, the only thing I want to talk about is opponents for humans. One thing I will say is that there's no really good matchup for humans. You could argue that Bretonians are a pretty soft opponent for humans, though they play in a similar way, and early chaos, because of the lack of skills, you've got a good chance against them as well. Though I don't think there's any team that really comes up and you go, yes, I'm so glad to see that opponent. That there are a couple that you look at and you think, oh damn, this is going to be hard. One of them is orcs, and the thing to do with orcs basically is to keep your distance. That's the main strategy when playing against orcs. Don't, don't, don't get stuck in a fight with orcs. Orcs want to fight, you don't. So your main thing is ball movement and general positioning, light screening, and staying away from those painful, painful punches that come from the big green gits. So when you're playing orcs, that's something to avoid. Another one is dwarves. Very similar story. You don't want to get caught up in a fight with them. The best way to play against dwarves in general, but with humans as well, is to play a kind of keep away game where basically you just keep the ball out of their reach at all possible times. If you do find that you're being based too often, you need to focus on securing the pieces that are coming forward with your linemen and your blitzers, and keeping the thrower and catcher well out of reach. So even if they do manage to lock down some of your team, make sure the ball is nowhere near them. That's the key thing. When playing against Skaven, they can really outmaneuver you, and against Skaven, it's got to be a very tight defensive game. Even when you're on offense, you've got to make sure there are always two or three pieces surrounding the ball. And basically, using small gaps on offense where you can put a lot of pieces where the Skaven have to break through and break into, and on defense, just keeping no gaps and holding the Skaven as much as possible while constantly getting in their face. So you want to try and do damage, because you've got the strength advantage over Skaven. Armor value, I mean. But at the same time, you're never going to outrun them. So don't try and be too silly with Skaven. Try and keep nice and tight, uh, it, both in defense and on offense. The same goes for the all the flavors of Elf. So the High Elf, the Dark Elf, and the Wood Elf. Wood Elf especially, because they're the fastest. Dark Elf and High Elf can play a similar game to you, though, so you're not even going to really win the fight. I mean, it's it's pretty even in terms of punch-up. You've got the skills to help you at first, but when there's all the dodge on the, on the Elf team, not so much anymore. Bretonians, they play in a very similar way to you, but they don't have as many pieces that can really do anything exciting. I mean, Bretonians, Bretonians are a pretty subpar race in general though they have very similar tactics in that they want to stand in your way and their key pieces do things in the background, so you're going to be playing basically the same kind of game against each other. Against Chaos, if it's very early, then your maneuverability and your basically all of your skills in combination are going to outdo Chaos because they don't have any skills starting off. But when you get to higher TV and the Chaos are becoming a bit more murdery, you're more an orc dwarf strategy where you're trying to stand off them. Don't don't get caught in a punch up with them because they will win the punch up nine times out of ten. Wood elves I've already mentioned with the other elves. Lizards are one of the worst matchups for humans because lizards can do both the fast thing and the strength thing, and they do both better than you do. So how the hell do you play lizards? Well, when you're on offense, you need to keep the ball out of the way, and you need to be punching skinks whenever you can. The skinks are the weak things, so punch the weak things and run away from the big things is the basic strategy. I mean, it's 
it's a hard match against lizards. Against a good lizard coach, humans are always going to struggle. But um, that is basically the only advice we can really give you, is try and hit the small guys and try not to get hit by the big guys. That's the strategy against lizards. Against Norse, it's a very interesting one, because Norse are a relatively similar team to you, but they have more blocking skills. They also have less agility skills, though, so you've got to kind of out-agility them. If you've got a lot of catches, that's usually quite good against Norse. Uh, if you have the big guy as well, they can usually lock up quite a few of the... He can usually lock up quite a few of the Norse and probably do some damage. Norse are going to get in your face, though, and... Um, that's kind of good for you because you have the armor value advantage, but at the same time, you're both going to take injuries. So, against Norse, it's basically hoping that armor value 7 does what it says on the tin. Because it's going to be a slog against Norse, basically. With Undead, it's kind of a similar story to the Lizards. You've got to avoid the big guys and punch the little guys. At least the Zombies and Skeletons aren't such a big deal for you, but the Ghouls, the Whites, the mummies especially, all of them can cause you all kinds of hurt. So you need to focus down these pieces as much as possible and avoid the mummies at all costs. Sometimes easier said than done, of course. Necromantic is very similar, but the wolves have that extra danger because they have that claw piece. And claw does damage extra to armor value 8 and above, and your entire team is armor value 8 and above. So doing damage to the wolves, doing damage to the ghouls, and avoiding the whites, avoiding the zombies as much as possible is the way to do it. Zombies, whites, and flesh golems move slowly, so if you can get away from them, it's not so bad. Uh, whites don't, sorry, but zombies and flesh golems do. Whites move quickly, wolves move quickly, ghouls move quickly. They're the three that are going to worry you in agility-wise. And you don't really want to get into a slog with whites. Though, if the wolves don't have block yet, hopefully you can put them out of the game with your blitzers. Nurgle is a similar story to Chaos, but they're faster. Well, they're not faster, sorry, but they're... No, they're not faster at all. They're, they cause problems with ball handling, so... You want to be passing as little as possible with Nurgle. It's more about positioning properly. And the Pestigors, the Chaos Warriors, and even the Rotters can cause you a lot of trouble if you let them get in your face. So, stay away from them at all costs, and keep the ball in safe hands. So... Kind of similar to Skaven, actually, in a strange kind of way. Try and take small spaces and try and get away from being locked into a corner at all times. And with Kemri, try and beat up on the skeletons. Try and avoid the Blitzras. Try and avoid the Tomb Guards. Easier said than done, of course, but that's basically the way it works. Um, and make sure that they don't have the ball. If they have the ball, knock it out of their hands because they struggle to pick it up. So every time they have the ball, get rid of it. And hopefully, hopefully can we make a mistake, which they're quite good at, and you can recover from it. But if can we don't make a mistake, then it's going to be a very difficult match, and you have to do a kind of slow screen to stop them from scoring against you. But most importantly, just keep the ball away from them as much as possible. And with Chaos Dwarfs, it's very similar to the Dwarf and Orc game, where you don't want to get toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, but they do have the weak piece, the Hobgoblin, that you can hopefully do a bit of damage to. So get your blitzers on those Hobgoblins, try and knock them out of the game and screen off well against the bull centaurs, and if they have a minotaur, avoid it for god's sake. It can really hurt. And that's it for the races. I'm not sure how useful this video is at the moment. I'll have a look at it. Uh, I am going to put it out regardless, just because I've done it. I'll see what it's like, see what I like, see what I don't like, and fix it from there. Any comments you want to give in regard to more advice for humans down below, more advice for to beginners in general down below. I will go through all the races over time though. Uh, in terms of absolute beginners, the thing that a lot of people recommend is that you try four races to start with and see which one you like the best. The four races are Human, which are a very strategy-based team, Orcs, which are a bash and control type team, then Dark Elves, which are the most forgiving agility-based team. You could argue Skaven as well, but I think Dark Elves are better at the agility thing in general for a beginner. and. Undead, though Undead, of course, is a race as a DLC. It's not a race that you start off with, but Undead is a very good kind of all-rounder team, somewhere in between Orc and Dark Elves. So if you are a complete beginner watching this and you were looking for basic advice, that's the basic advice. Try these four teams. Whichever team you like the best out of those four teams, if you like one of them specifically, keep playing them. 
If you like one of them better than others but haven't quite found it, then look for a similar team to the team that you like the best, and people can give you further advice in regards to that. Anyway, that's all for the humans. Thanks for watching if you have watched. Um, not really sure how good this video has been, but I'll have a look at it and I'll decide from there. So any further advice, any comments you have, etc., leave them below. I will read them, I will respond, and I will take all of your advice into consideration. Thank you for watching, have fun on the pitch. Bye bye for now.